Genesis 37. Starting from verse 1. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. These are the family records of Jacob. At 17 years of age, Joseph tended sheep with his brothers. The young man was working with the sons of Bilnah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons because Joseph was a son born to him in his old age and he made a robe of many colours for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak peacefully about him. Then Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. There we were, binding sheaves of grain in the field. Suddenly my sheaf stood up, and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Are you really going to reign over us? His brothers asked him. Are you really going to rule us? So they hated him even more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and told it to his brothers. Look, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun, moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. He told his father and brothers, and his father rebuked him. What kind of dream is this that you have had? He said, am I and your mother and your brothers really going to come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. His brothers had gone to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, Your brothers, you know, are pasturing the flocks at Shechem. Get ready, I am sending you to them. I am ready, Joseph replied. Then Israel said to him, Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are doing, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the Hebron Valley, and he went to Shechem. And behold, a man found him there, wandering in the field, and asked him, What are you looking for? I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph said. Can you tell me where they are pasturing their flocks? They've moved on from here, the man said. And I heard them say, Let's go to Dotham. So Joseph set out after his brothers and found them at Dotham. They saw him at a distance, and before he had reached them, they plotted to kill him. They said to one another, Oh, look, here comes that dream expert. So now, come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. We can say that a vicious animal ate him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to save him from them. He said, Let's not take his life. Reuben also said to them, Don't shed blood. Throw him into this pit in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him intending to rescue him from them and return him to his father. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped off Joseph's robe, the robe of many colours that he had on. Then they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty, without water. They sat down to eat a meal, and behold, when they looked up, there was a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were carrying aromatic gum, balsam and resin, going down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come on, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. When Midianite traders passed by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the pit and sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, The boy is gone. What am I going to do? So they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a male goat, and dipped the robe in its blood. They sent the robe of many colours to their father and said, We found this. Examine it. Is it your son's robe or not? His father recognised it. It is my son's robe, he said. A vicious animal has devoured him. 
Joseph has been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth around his waist, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will go down to Sheol to my son, mourning. And his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph to Egypt, in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the guards. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, before we start, let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, give us eyes to see and hearts open to your word. And may we receive uh, your word and may it challenge us, uh, rebuke us and encourage us. Amen. Well, families are dysfunctional at the best of times, aren't they? Uh, They're often messy and not everyone gets along. Well, I think my family, I think perhaps is just next level. Uh, Over the last few months, uh, things have been getting worse for our family. Uh, And about a month ago, things really blew up. You see, I've got a number of siblings Um, and there's one brother in particular that I don't really get along with. Uh, That's a bit of an understatement, actually. I I actually hate my brother. You know, you you see your brother and you just want to give him a big hug, and I see my brother and I just want to... Can't stand the bloke. Uh, I've got nothing good to say about him. He's the sibling who never gets into trouble. He can do no wrong. He's always been dad's favourite. I'm sure there's one of those in every family. What makes it worse, I think, is that he's not even the oldest. Uh, My half-brother, a brother from a different mother, uh, he's the oldest among us. Now, there's 12 of us. Joseph, the one we all hate, he's actually one of the youngest I guess it's always been in our family, though. My great-grandfather, Abraham, he chose Isaac, uh, that's my grandfather, uh, over his older brother, Ishmael. My father, Jacob, was chosen over his older brother, Esau. And us children, well, we know that Rachel, Joseph's mother, is favoured over our mother's. I think what gets me is that Dad wasn't even subtle about his favouritism of Joseph. While us brothers, we're out working the field, you know, sweat on our brow, making the most for Dad's return, Jacob gives precious little Joseph a fancy robe. It's beautiful, it's ornate, you know, it's got long sleeves and it flows all the way down to his ankles. You know, fat chance he's ever going to lift a finger in that. He's never going to break a sweat in it, is he? Anyway, it's not just the robe. It's kind of what it symbolises. Now, the robe isn't just fashion. Everyone knows that Joseph is being positioned to take over as head of the family. He's the heir. Dad's chosen, and this is his clear way of showing it. What happened a month or so, you ask? Well, if Joseph's tattletaling and his robe wasn't bad enough, Joseph started having these dreams. Now, I don't know about you, but for us living here in Canaan, dreams are important and really not something you want to dismiss. I can still remember uh, the stories that Father Jacob and Grandfather Isaac used to tell us about the dreams and visions that they had. They had crazy dreams, like angels going up and down ladders to heaven. Uh, He used to tell us how Yahweh, the Lord, had appeared to them and had told them that he would be with them, that he would bless them, and that he'd even make a great nation come from them. Dad still tells of the time where where he got his bung hip after wrestling with God. Uh, That's that's actually why he's called Israel now. 
Dreams have divine elements to them. We all know it. And that's what makes Joseph's dreams so disturbing for us. He had two dreams, uh, very similar. I think the, the second one was the worst. It was just downright disrespectful. The first dream uh, was standing in a paddock, you know, and his sheaf of grain, his stands up, and 11 other sheaves of grain all bow down to his. You know, I'm no expert, but it doesn't take a genius to work out what's going on. I think Joseph's saying that one day he's going to rule over us. You know, that one's pretty clear. What I don't get, though, is why the grain? Here in Canaan, we deal with flocks. We've got cows, goats, sheep, uh, camels, uh, donkeys... Pretty much, if it's on four legs and not a pig, then we've got it. But we don't do anything with grain. So that bit really confused us. Joseph's second dream, well, that got us. We already know that he's dad's favourite, but does he really need to keep telling us about them? And that's what's worse about the second dream. Even Jacob, our mother, our, our father and our mother's, apparently will one day bow down to Joseph. Look, I'm glad Dad got angry at this and he rebuked Joseph. But he said that he'd keep this in mind. I wonder if perhaps he realises that this might actually come true. Here in Canaan, we've got a good thing going. Our flocks are increasing, our families are growing. All these dreams and this dreamer is going to do is disrupt our own plans and prosperity. Like I said, we hated our brother. And so when the opportune time came, uh, we, we dealt with him. About a month ago, we were out tending the flocks on a stock route the other side of Dotham. We were supposed to be near Shechem, but we kind of stay clear of there for now. Now, we don't really talk about Shechem as a family, Uh, What happened in Shechem a couple of years ago stayed in Shechem. So there we were at Dotham, miles away from where we were meant to be, and Joseph still finds us. I've got no idea how on earth he found us. Anyway, us brothers, we'd been brooding for months and months about how much we hated Joseph, and we'd kind of been toying with the idea of getting rid of him. We figured the best way to kill all these elaborate and preposterous dreams he was having, was to kill the dreamer. Who's going to bow down to a dead teenager? Well, we see G- uh, Joseph coming over the rise, and I don't know who it was, Dan, Gad, or Asha, one of the blokes. Uh, they go, oh, here comes the dreamer. You know, a bit of a throwaway comment, you know, about dropping little Joe into a pit to scare him. You know, we all laugh, think it's a bit of a joke, but then the mood kind of changes. And we thought, maybe we could just kill him. You know, there and then. No one's around to see, and we just tell Jacob that he'd been eaten by a wild animal. As soon as he comes close, we grabbed him stripped him of his royal-looking robe and wrestled him, wrestled with him until we'd thrown into him into one of the pits. Look, the plan to kill him was going well, but it all went south when Reuben just happened to hear about the plans. Talk about Reuben being in the right place at the right time, hey. All that energy, scheming and throwing Joseph into the pit, man, it made us hungry. So we cooked up some grub. You know, we, we just took a goat from the flock, uh, from Jacob's flock, figuring he wouldn't notice, and we cooked it up. Do we feel bad that Joseph was in the pit cold and scared while we were munching away on some nice goat? Not really. You know, he deserved it after all. Anyway, while we're eating, one of the guys just happened to look up and, you know, would you know it, there just happened to be a caravan of Ishmaelites going from Gilead down to Egypt. You know, they come through here every now and then, but to have one passing through at that time, I mean, like, what are the odds? You know, that's when Judah had his great idea. 
You know, Judah, he's a thinker. He's got a good head on his shoulders. He's really going places. His thought was, don't kill the boy, sell him. Let's make some money. Sell him to the Israelites, not lay a hand on him ourselves. You know, after all, he is our own flesh and blood. I guess what he was thinking was that whatever happens after this, well, that's not on our heads. You know, we've wiped our hands clean of him. We can go back to business tending the flock. It wasn't bad. We ended up getting 20 pieces of silver for him. You know, it's not much split between the 10 of us, but it's easy money for betraying our own. And we certainly didn't tell Dad about it. After it was all said and done, Reuben came back and boy was he outraged. Here he is tearing his clothes saying, where am I to go? You'd think he actually cared for Joseph. Maybe it was just that he was concerned for himself because he was going to be the one who was going to take responsibility. He was meant to have responsibility for him. Either way, we couldn't change what we'd done. So we slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in its blood. We figured that would be the most convincing way of deceiving uh, Jacob that a wild animal had devoured Joseph. You know, it's funny actually, looking back on it, Jacob and his mother, Rebecca, used uh, goats, goat meat, goat skin, to deceive his father, Isaac, into giving him the family blessing. It's funny how things work out, isn't it? Well, we sent Joseph's precious robe back to father. We made sure we were a few days behind it. And we just let him jump to the conclusion. We merely said, is this your son's? You know, he bought the deception hook, line and sinker. Yeah, of course he's upset, uh, but at least Joseph's been dealt with and we don't have to worry about his fanciful dreams coming true. What about Joseph? Yeah, I don't really know. Uh, Last we heard, he'd been taken to a foreign land, not our own, down to Egypt and was bought as a slave by some guy called Potiphar. Who knows what will become of him? Look, if he's half as annoying in Egypt as he was in Canaan, then probably nothing good one can imagine. As for us, we'll keep doing our thing, watching the flocks and growing Israel's possessions. It's looking to be a great season and we're pretty comfortable and secure. Joseph had his dreams, but we've got our own dreams. We've got plans for the future and they certainly don't involve bowing down to our little brother or following his dreams, even if they were from Yahweh, this God from, of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Well, I want to break from the narrative now uh, and just look at three observations for us and hopefully it will raise a few questions for you. Uh, First observation, uh, the dysfunctional nature of God's people reveals their sinfulness. So the most obvious observation that I'm sure you noted uh, was just how dysfunctional Jacob's family is. For generations now, there's been deception, plotting against family members. Bitter rivalry permeates through God's chosen people. From the start, we as readers should be aware that Jacob has favoured Rachel and that favouritism flows on to Joseph. From its outset, there is tension. At a surface level, this is uh, there's obvious tension between Joseph and the other brothers. They hate him because of his dreams and his words. They're jealous of his potential and favouritism. But underneath... I think there's a deeper tension, one that shows that they are more like Esau than they would like to admit. It's the belief that they know best from who should be heir of the growing empire to the alarming dreams that Joseph had. God, in his mercy, had revealed to the family what his plans for the future was. But this jarred with how they thought family affairs should play out. 
the real tension is would they follow God's plan or would they follow their own? Would they live in the now like Uncle Esau or would they live now in light of what God had promised them in the future? I wonder how you answered Bernard's questions last week. I wonder if you can remember Bernard's questions last week. Do you see yourself in the line of Esau, living for the now, or in the line of Jacob, living now in light of eternity? And how does your life reflect that choice? For the brothers, perhaps, they saw God's plan for the future as damaging or detrimental to their own goals and ambitions? Did they push back against God's dreams for Joseph when it meant discomfort and their own desires and plans would potentially be sidelined? Either way, the events in chapter 37 reveal their actions to be selfish and sinful in nature. What better way to kill the God-given dream of Joseph than to kill the dreamer? and see what becomes of his dreams. The tension isn't just uh, sibling rivalry, but between God's way, even if that is uncomfortable, and that of their own. Isn't that the same struggle that we face each day? Laying down our own plans and ambitions, our skills and financial freedom at Jesus' feet... And instead of my will be done, just like the brothers, rather saying, our Father in heaven, your will be done, even if that comes at great cost. I think we are more like the brothers than we want to admit. A second observation, and this is where uh, God's wonderful hope comes in, uh, Again, there's two readings, the surface reading and the deeper second reading. As the narrative unfolds, the reader is positioned from the brother's perspective. We see the events unfold from their eyes, and as such, we see see things just happen. Joseph is promoted above them, a sign of things to come. They are driven by their emotions, much like Esau, And they seize the opportune moments when they arise by chance. By the end of the chapter, it would seem as though they've gotten away with their ruse. And Jacob, the heel grabber and deceiver, has himself been deceived. But behind all these events, we see the hand of God at play, working towards his redemptive plan for his people and the fulfillment of his covenantal promises that we heard uh, Steve read out in Genesis 15. Starting with Abram, God has been choosing the old and the weak, the barren and the unlikely to carry on his promises. God does not leave events to chance. The God who can open and close the womb is the same God who can send a random man into a field to assist Joseph on his way to his brother's or direct a caravan of Ishmaelites uh, heading down to Egypt in order to buy and sell Joseph, or even choosing the very person Joseph would be sold to in Egypt. All are outworkings of his plan. When we pick up the story of Joseph in chapter 39, we see this implicit understanding of God being in control become more explicit. The narrator tells us that God was with Joseph no more, no less than six times. When we view Scripture through this lens, we see no chance meetings or no strange happenings, but rather God in control. It's a pattern we see over and over in Scripture. At the very moment when things seem to be unravelling, the beloved son being sent on a task, only to be sold for pieces of silver, God is present and working for his glory. I wonder if that sounds familiar. 
the beloved son being sent on a task, but only to be sold for silver. There are many similarities between Joseph and Jesus. Both beloved sons, both obedient to their father's command, rejected by their own, and and betrayed for a handful of silver. Joseph is used by God to rescue his people in a time of desperate need, uh, when the famine strikes, and we'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. But where Joseph saves God's people from physical needs, Jesus willingly dies in our place and saves us from our greatest need, the spiritual death caused by our sin and rejection of God. Just as Joseph was a dreamer, so too Jesus was seen as a dreamer. Tear down the temple and raise it up in three days? Jesus, you're dreaming. What better way to kill a dream than to kill the dreamer? But Jesus wasn't just dreaming, was he? When he said those words in the Gospel of John, in chapter 2. No, that was a promise and one that he fulfilled. God's track record leaves no doubt as to whether or not he'll make good on his promises. Jesus did tear down the temple, his own body on the cross, and he took it up again three days later, resurrected in glory. The brothers thought they had gotten away with killing the dreamer. So they, so did the Pharisees. The brothers chose the things of this world, their own status and desires over humbling themselves beneath God's plan. They acted more like Esau and show us that maybe we do too. God is faithful to his plans and his promises, despite our sinfulness. And as Jade pointed out, can, he can use our sinfulness to fulfill those plans. God shows that throughout Genesis and ultimately in the work of the cross that he is faithful to his promises. He will continue to be faithful to his plans and promises for our good and his glory until Christ returns. Do we likewise strive for the plans and promises of God? So let me leave you with this question. Chapter 37 naturally raises this tension for us. Will we align our plans and desires with that of God's? Or will we push back, seeking our own path, like the brothers, only living now? Or will we live now in light of eternity?